Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerSportsBetting.com. Remember, especially for this video, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Well, as expected, as we've been discussing for a while here, Carl Frotch has decided he wants no part of James DeGale. In fact, he was willing to vacate the IBF super middleweight title rather than fight fellow countryman, Olympic gold medalist, James DeGale in a fight that would have been big on a host of levels. Box office, uh, who's the best in the division in the United Kingdom, uh, world title fight, etc. Right? Now let me say this, and I know it's going to be controversial. Understand, these are just the views of one man. Right? I know many people have weighed in here online. I know fighters have weighed in. Paul Smith has weighed in uh, on this subject. It's my personal belief that we forget too often that this is professional prize fighting. That these men are actually working. They're getting paid. They're taking huge risks. Right? They're risking their health. They see old timers, even great old time fighters with slurred speech, with health problems with honorages that vanished the minute those fighters started losing. They've seen fighters who were at the top of the mountain and then had a couple of bad fights and lost their legacies. Right? So as I see it, just from an occupational standpoint, these champions really don't owe us anything. Right? Understand, we the fight fan have been blessed with several great performances in big fights by Carl Frotch, both in winning and losing efforts. Right? I thought the first Mikkel Kessler fight was a great fight. Right? Frotch certainly delivered in the rematch of the Mikkel Kessler fight. I thought Frotch against Andre Ward. Frotch came back late in that fight. I thought he lost the fight, but he came back. He was still trying to win the fight. He was still putting pedal to the metal. Understand, he came back and actually KO'd Jermaine Taylor when Jermaine Taylor was a much more vital fighter. Right? Carl Frotch, George Groves, let's face it. Rocky start for Frotch that first fight, but he hung in there, didn't he? Right? Whether you think that fight should have been stopped or not, there's never a moment in that fight where you think Carl Frotch has given up. Right? This is a fight where when he goes down, his shoulders hit the canvas. That's how knocked over he was. The guy never thought about throwing in the towel. Ever. Got the stoppage in the first fight. The second fight, of course, the stoppage is more emphatic. So we, the boxing public, is well into the bonus. You know, I believe, we think, just as a group, that fighters owe us the best possible title defenses, right? We think that, really, fighters themselves should be interested in always proving to us that they are the very best in their weight class, right? Maybe the truth is a bit more nuanced. Maybe a fighter is risking his health, and the fighter needs to always ask himself, what's in it for me? Is this worth the risk? Right? Shouldn't I be picking my spots, picking fights that are going to put the most money in my bank account and help me and my family the long term? Right? You know, when you go to work, aren't you looking for the most lucrative deals? Not necessarily the deals that are going to test your metal the most. Now, I'll say this. Let's talk about why Carl Frotch is not fighting James DeGale, and I'm just telling you my point of view. Right? First, I think Carl Frotch knows what I've been saying here online for a long time, that he can't beat James DeGale. Right? James DeGale is going to have to fall down a flight of stairs 
or turn to hard drugs, methamphetamine, heroin, right? Stay out late at night, hitting strip clubs and drinking liquor to lose the edge he has on Carl Frotch. Because if he shows up after a real training camp ready to fight, if James DeGale shows up on his A game, I personally don't believe, short of a lucky punch, there's anything Carl Frotch can do to beat him. I think there's a talent gap between the two fighters. So in my opinion, Carl Frotch looks at James DeGale, and keep in mind, folks, they have the same promoter. Right? Making the fight should take two minutes. Right? I believe he looks at James DeGale and he sees real competition. He sees a likely loss on his record. Right? That's the first reason I don't believe he's fighting James DeGale. The second reason is he still has a title. Right? He, he had multiple titles. He could vacate the IBF title, which he's done, and still be the WBA super world super middleweight champion. Right? By the way, that's the title. WBA super world super middleweight title holder. Right? So he still has a title. So understand, Carl Frotch's next fight is going to be a title fight. Right? So understand, he's giving up one belt. Right, which would have involved fighting an opponent who he couldn't beat unless that opponent, you know, loses it. Right? But he still has a belt. Another reason Carl Frotch is avoiding James DeGale is that he also has political cover. Understand legacies are funny things. We forget the lay of the land a few years later. Right? Carl Frotch has fought a man who beat James DeGale already, twice. And his resume is going to show that he won both of those fights by stoppages. So you can imagine, if you're the Carl Frotch biographer, or if you're listening to Carl and helping him write his autobiography, because <laughs> you know these things are coming down the pike, um, you know, the argument is going to be, why would I be afraid of James DeGale when I beat George Groves twice? You know, people are claiming I'm afraid of James DeGale after I fought countless men with similar hype. Lucien Boutte, right? You know, <laughs> let's face it. Accusing Carl Frotch of dodging a fighter is going to be a tough argument to make given his complete body of work. But as I've said, right, just like Ray Robinson, in my opinion, avoided Charlie Burley, <laughs> right? Just like Joe Frazier avoided his former sparring partner, Kenny Norton, right? I think those in the know, those who look at fight styles, know Carl Frotch wanted no part of James DeGale, right? George Groves is not James DeGale, right? Just, just food for thought. I understand Groves won a close fight, right? I would debate that, but I understand he was awarded a close fight. Okay, good for him. He's not James DeGale. Another reason, and we shouldn't overlook this reason, as to why Carl Frotch vacated the IBF title, right, is that he also had an Andre Durrell problem, didn't he? Right? Name the close Carl Frotch fights. Ooh, Andre Durrell is right there among them. Keep in mind, Durrell really has the one distinction of being the man who possibly beat Carl Frotch in his hometown. Right? I thought Durrell beat Carl Frotch in Nottingham. Right? These other fights, you know, Carl Frotch fights... Um, you know, Mikel Kessler in Mikel Kessler's backyard and stuff like that, Frotch can claim, hey, I was on the road. Right? I believe Frotch fought Andre Durrell in America. Right? Um, not Andre Durrell, but Andre Ward in America. Well, Andre Durrell came to him, didn't he? That fight's a photo finish. Officially a split decision. 
Now understand, Karl Frotsch knows better than anyone else that by vacating the IBF title, he set up a fight between James DeGale and Andre Durrell. Somebody has to lose that fight, folks. Some part of Karl Frotsch's problem, whether it's DeGale or Durrell, is going to go away. Right? So the chess move to give up the IBF title, knowing that two of your rivals are going to have to have a gunfight, might actually help Karl Frotsch down the road. Right? Let's also talk about another reason why Karl Frotsch gave up the IBF title. It's because it leaves him available to fight two guys for whom the bloom might be off the rose, right? Let me say this. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., if he comes in the ring on his A game, I think he gives Carl Frotch all he can handle. The problem is, when is the last time you saw Chavez Jr. on his A game? In fact, hasn't it been so long since Chavez Jr. has even been in the ring that we would have to give him directions on how to get there if a fight's scheduled? Right? Let's just say Chavez Jr. might not be close to Chavez Jr. Keep in mind how he leaves the middleweight division. He gets spanked by Sergio Martinez. Then, of course, his weight's so hazy, they couldn't even tell us the weight class for that first Brian Vera fight, right? Just a few days before that fight happened, right? So we really don't know what's going on with Chavez Jr., right? Chavez Jr. as a super middleweight, wow, is he going to be as effective as he was as a middleweight? We just don't know. Also, keep in mind, prime Chavez Jr., Who's in his corner? Freddie Roach. Who's in his corner today? Do we know? Right? So let's say that Carl Frotch understands he has a fight against a guy who might have a bigger name at this point than game. In fact, I'm very curious to see what happens in Chavez Jr.'s fight against Andres Fonfara, who I know is going to come in the ring with volume. Right, so just to understand, Carl understands that he would be catching Chavez Jr. at the right time. And no doubt that fight would be very lucrative. Right, if you're Carl Frotch and you already have established your championship credentials, hell, you're still with the belt. Right, at what point do you say, you know what, I'm not going to deal with DeGale who I've just seen dismantle Brandon Gonzalez and Marco Antonio Parabin. Rather, I'm going to deal with the guy who has lost Freddie Roach as a trainer, hasn't been in the ring for a while, and is relatively new to divisions outside of middleweight. Let's talk about another guy for whom the bloom might be off the rose. Now, let me say this. I think Carl Frotch is making a mistake with that assessment. But I have to say, I've never seen Bernard Hopkins look worse than in the closing rounds of his fight against Sergei Kovalev. Right? Let's just say, if you ask most people, what's the worst you've seen Hopkins look? Oh, I got to tell you, those last few rounds of the Kovalev fight have to be at the top, if not near the top of the list. So, of course, you're looking at Hopkins' age. Wow, 50. <laughs> 50. That means he was 30 20 years ago, right? And then you see a guy looking old in the ring against Kovalev. And I'm sure in Frotch's mind, he's thinking, you know what? This just might be the right time to face Bernard Hopkins. Right, let's get real, too. One of Joe Calzaghe's biggest victories was against Bernard Hopkins. And let's face it, Carl Frotch has always been chasing the ghost of Joe Calzaghe. 
right? So now, of course, by giving up the IBF belt, right, by avoiding James DeGale, Carl Frotch is still in play to fight Bernard Hopkins, who's talking about fighting him in Nottingham. Let me say this, too. I'm sure Carl Frotch is looking at the CompuBox numbers off of Hopkins' last few fights, right? The Babu Trumanov fight. The Kovalev fight. And I'm sure he's looking at really low volume. He has to be thinking to himself, Carl, you know, Bernard Hopkins is hardly throwing punches these days. I'm sure Frotch is also aware of the fact that Bernard hasn't stopped anyone for years. Right? Bernard's fights are going the distance. So think about it. Carl Frotch must be thinking to himself, if this fight is in Nottingham, where the people love me, and if I'm still standing at the end of 12 rounds against an opponent who is this low volume, how could I not get the decision? In other words, I get the big payday. I don't have the risk of being stopped like the Gale stopped his last two opponents. Right? Take a look at the end of the Brandon Gonzalez fight. Understand, there's no doubt about the end of that fight, right? Carl Frotch gets to avoid that mess. He gets the payday against a 50-year-old who hasn't knocked out anyone for years who's willing to fight him in his backyard, right? If you're Carl Frotch, you're thinking, what's not to like? Not only that, Bernard Hopkins already is a first ballot Hall of Famer. Right? I mean, there's just the formality of Bernard retiring, right? That might not happen for years, but there's the formality of Bernard retiring, and then whatever the period is, right, the mandatory period between retirement and when they vote. But right now, Carl Frotch knows Bernard Hopkins is a Hall of Famer, so he knows if he wins that fight, he has a big scalp on his resume. With James DeGale, as talented as he is, who knows? Maybe he does take up a heroin addiction, right? Maybe he, you know, hops in a car and drives off a cliff, right? You know how young guys sabotage themselves. There's no guarantee right now that James DeGale, who still hasn't been a world champion, makes it to the Boxing Hall of Fame. So Carl Frotch is thinking in terms of his legacy. Carl Frotch is thinking in terms of fighting at home and getting paid. So let me say this. I'm very pro-fighter. I don't have a problem with a fighter who boxes for a living saying to himself, you know what, it's about the money now. I've been in this game. If the fans don't know, that I'm willing to fight difficult fights by this point in my career, then they're never going to know. The haters are always going to hate, right? I've already signed my name to the wall. I've already fought, name the fighter, Glenn Johnson, Lucien Butte, Mikhail Kessler, George Groves, right? I've already fought a hit list, Jermaine Taylor, right? Arthur Abraham. I've already fought enough guys where I can now say, you know what, I'm not going to fight this young lion because he's too dangerous, right? I'm going to give up this belt. I'm going to keep this other belt, and I'm going to go on a tour of guys who haven't fought in a while, Chavez Jr., right, and guys who look their worst in their last fight, Bernard Hopkins, right? I don't fault Carl Frotch. For any of that, especially with other young lions at the gate, right? Here is Frotch at super middleweight. He looks out his window. Who does he see? Andre Durrell. Anthony Durrell, right? You know, at a certain point, you're like, whoa, whoa, man. This is a jungle. There are too many tough guys out here. You know, in an earlier generation, you'd be surprised. Some guys would actually say, hey, I'm retired. Then they would wait for a couple of years, see another guy come by who they think they could beat, then they'd come out of retirement to fight that fighter. Right? Isn't that the Ray Leonard story? 
So I'm not blaming Carl Frotch for ducking James DeGale, but let's be clear here. He's ducking James DeGale. Let's be clear here. If Carl Frotch thought James DeGale was an easy fight, especially since James DeGale is a member of the British Empire, MBE, right? Olympic gold medalist for the UK, right? Same promoter as Carl Frotch. Carl Frotch would be taking that fight. Carl Frotch would be taking that payday. He's not because I believe he knows the truth. These young lions are dangerous. I think James DeGale and Andre Durrell would, let's just say, keep Carl Frotch up late at night. Right? He's choosing a different path, more power to him. I hope Carl gets even wealthier. I hope Carl helps uh, his legacy. I hope Carl gives us some great fights. Right? But I, I can't call Carl the best in his division in his own country. Right? That's how I see it. Let me hear how you see it. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.